What's up everyone, Carlos here. I'm back with another video compilation covering various lore topics throughout different franchises. Continuing with the previous videos of before, this one will include videos I made in the past, but all about gaming lore. If you like longer videos, then this would be good for you. It goes through a lot of history about the story of each game. The video is one hour long and it includes franchises like Crisis, Left 4 Dead, SNK's fighting game character Takuma Sakazaki and his alter ego Mr. Karate, the origins of the darkness, the black light virus from the prototype games, the origin of Spawn, some lore within the fear games, and some look into the lore about the Strog which were part of Quake 2 and Quake 4. I'm going to leave timestamps in the comments section and also the video description. This way you can skip to a topic of interest. Thanks for watching and leave a like on the video. Subscribe to see more stuff like this in the future. What are the Strog in the video game Quake 2? This game was released in 1997 and with it came an enemy unlike any other. Quake 2's enemy was seen as some type of cybernetic alien race. An early invasion on Earth led humanity to fight back and push the Strog out of our solar system. But humans would push on and try to attack the Strog on their homeworld. But during this mission called Operation Alien Overlord in the Quake 2 story, most of the forces from Earth were taken down or crashed upon their homeworld called Strogos. The home planet of the Strog had three moons, along with a similar size, gravity, and atmosphere to Earth. Although this planet could support humans and other forms of organic life, most of the planet was seen as a barren wasteland. The Strog would invade other planets by the use of slipgates, that allow them to travel quickly to any location. A portal would be created by a device called the black hole generator. The slipgates would vary in size depending on how big of an army is being sent through. Once the Strog invade a planet, they wage war on any intelligent species there, and when the planet is in their possession, they strip it of all life until there is nothing left. The Strog are always in search of new planets to conquer in order to consume and assimilate the flesh of other life forms. They are a mix of artificially melded organic bodies and mechanical augmentation. This race is extremely hostile and does not understand the concept of peace. This race would expand its military force and this would lead to mass industrialization on Strogos. They would create mass amounts of pollution and destruction on their homeworld which erased most of the world's ecology. The Strog are controlled by an intelligent hive mind civilization. The origins of the Strog was never revealed but there have been some theories. One person suggested the Strog were created by an intelligent species, but when the creators left the planet, the Strog decided to continue its existence. They adapted and created a hierarchy among their military. This would serve as some type of political leadership, but when their planet would run out of resources, they would fight endless wars against another species and assimilate the defeated races. The second theory is that they either evolved on their own or through the use of a supercomputer that made simple calculations for survival. Another theory is that they were once a race similar to humans, but their reliance on technology had taken over their race. In some way, we could see this as the next step of humanity, grafting our technology to our bodies to make us better in many ways. Now in the story of Quake 4, Matthew Kane had also mentioned that the Strog's origins were linked to some type of Frankenstein event. Now in the event of a war or invasion, any life forms that are captured are brought for strogification. This process is extremely painful and gruesome. Depending on what role the host is chosen for, they may end up losing all or some of their limbs without the use of anesthetic or sterilization. These parts would be replaced with cybernetic augmentations. Not only will they take a live host, but they will also use the bodies of the deceased. They would also remove unneeded organs from the body and the final procedure includes a neurocyte implanted into the brain. This allows the Macron to control the Strog. They would also be linked to the Strog communication network that gives them tactical information about their technology. The character Matthew Kane in Quake 4 was the only surviving human who did not fully undergo the complete process of Strogification. Therefore, his mind was not under the control of the Macron. While the Macron can be seen as the commander of the Strog military, the Nexus can be seen as the brain of the Strog species. The food source of the Strog is something called Stroyant. 
It's made by grinding up the remains of their victim's body parts or even from fallen comrades. This substance appears as a green slime that contains large amounts of proteins and other nutrients that the Strog require. The Strog have a strong processing creature and a giant heart in one of their facilities that overlooks the production of this substance. Destroyed health stations appear as it removes stomach attached to a device that dispenses strong fluids for the Strog. The Strogification success rate is actually very high, but any defective bodies will be discarded or processed into Stroyant. While being a species focused on war and assimilating other life forms, they have also found a way to use their death to an advantage. The nanites that are inserted into a host during Strogification will also play a part in aiding the Strog army. Upon death, the nanites would dissolve and the body would vaporize. This matter would then enter the strong environment, and the particles could then be collected and processed into strong production. So in a way, even in death, the strong will feed their own war. Now the palace of Cerberon in Quake 2 does show some flags with an insignia. This could have belonged to the species that was there a long time ago before it became known as the strong. And during the events of the first Quake video game, you could also find a similar insignia, but there was no clear explanation as to why it was there. It's possible the events of Quake had taken place after Quake 2 and Quake 4. Perhaps they helped Shub Niggurat's forces in preparing Earth for its harvesting campaign. So that's a look at the Strog along with some history. If you're a fan of this enemy, tell me which type of Strog is your favorite. For myself, I would have to choose the Gladiator in Quake 2 and the Macron in Quake 4. What are the Ceph in the video game Crisis? Their name alone stands for Cephalopod, but sometimes they go by the name of Charybdis, which is known as a sea monster in Greek mythology. This alien race is highly advanced and very hostile towards humanity. They originate from the Triangulum Galaxy, which is 3 million light years from Earth. Some records indicate that they arrived on Earth around 65 million years ago, and their sole purpose was to seed life on the planet. There was also speculation that their involvement led to the mass extinction throughout different time periods, but then, at some point in time, they went into a dormant state. Then, in the year 1919, Jacob Hargreave went to investigate the site at Tunguska. Along with his colleagues Carl Rash and Walter Gould, they would discover the Ceph alien species. This would lead to later events that would awaken the Ceph lithoships across the Earth. Jacob Hargreave would take the technology to create the nanosuit, which received upgrades over time. The novel of the story does mention that Jacob speculated that the Ceph on Earth were the gardeners of the planet, and were automated to awaken at a certain point to scan the planet for scientific data. Later on, they became aware of humans slowly destroying the planet, and their work of seeding life over millions of years has been destroyed. They see human beings as a threat to their ways of creation. This leads to the war between the Ceph and humanity. The Ceph were fully awakened during the events at Ling Shan Islands. A massive spacecraft was claimed by Korean forces and they awoke the Ceph while trying to steal their technology. They planned to use it as a giant source of power, but this ship's purpose was meant for recon missions on a planet. It would adapt to different environments and harvest energy to prepare for phase two which is deploying new troops that have adapted to Earth's environment. This spaceship can release an ice sphere that freezes and kills off any life within a certain area. The next phase would be a mass invasion. The Ceph would have various types of units within their military force, like grunts, stalkers, devastators, scouts, pingers, hunters, and gunships. These troops would be led by a ground unit known as the Mastermind, and the supreme leader was the Alpha Ceph. And just like the Mastermind, it has telekinetic powers. When the Alpha Ceph is destroyed, the Ceph tend to lose any sense of guidance, and in turn, they show more animalistic behaviors, or go into a dormant state when they run out of energy. During the events of Crisis 3, a wormhole was created to bring forth a massive Ceph warship. It was meant to assist in the colonization of Earth, but it was destroyed when Prophet took control of the Archangel satellite and used its weapons. The explosion led to the wormhole closing, and this ended the war, for now. The Ceph would also deploy an engineered nanovirus to infect and kill humans and higher apes. Some samples of human tissue were found on the Ceph spaceship, which could mean that it was used as research material. 
the Ceph were seen to harvest any type of protein biomass for their use. All of the Ceph technology has some interaction with the viral spores. One theory is that this virus is not actually a designed weapon, but is acting as an external immune system which kills off other life forms that come into contact with it. The nanosuit, which is derived from alien technology, also carries these viral spores. This will eventually infect the host wearing it. The alien species we know as the Ceph had a boneless body structure that would live in cold temperatures with a low gravity. They create their own technology, which has the ability to adapt to any environment, either cold, hot, gassy, or changes in gravity. Their bodies are so fragile to damage that when shot by gunfire, they will explode and leave nothing behind. Without their armor, they are sometimes referred to as ectomorphs because of their thin bodies and very little muscle mass. They seem to thrive in a low gravity environment and with any collective intelligence. The Alpha Ceph served as a central control for all the Ceph. They showed qualities of a hive species and their knowledge was inherited from their parent hive. This quickly allows them to adapt to different environments. And in the case of humans, our knowledge is passed down by generations which is in fact a slower process. While the human brain has evolved enough to dominate a single planet, the Ceph hive mind is engineered to dominate an entire universe. And because the Ceph were on Earth for millions of years, they created suits that were adapted to Earth's gravity. I wanted to cover the Ceph alien species because the Crisis video games are one of my favorite. Although the franchise is in a very bad situation right now, and most gamers have forgotten about it, I do hope it returns one day. So if you never got to play the Crisis video games, I highly recommend you try them out. What is the nano suit in Crisis, and where does it come from? The origins of this suit date back to the year 1919, when Jacob Hargreave traveled to a site in Tunguska, and along with his colleagues, Carl Rash and Walter Gould, they discovered the Ceph and took back their alien technology to be reverse engineered for their own plans. Hargreave assumed this alien species would someday return to Earth. So his plan was to use their technology and give mankind a fighting chance if a war between the two species would ever occur. The nanosuit was a power armored exoskeleton designed for humans. The prototype required combat data before it could be improved, so the 1.0 model was designed and deployed to Lingshang Island to combat the Ceph. Hargreave was fully aware of the Ceph on the island and wanted to test the nanosuit against the Ceph. It would also give him data on how the Ceph would combat someone who is using their own technology against them. The suit has nano muscle fibers that can interact with the host and be used in different ways. They can harden together for increased armor, provide a boost in strength, improve on their running speed, and it can also bend light to give the perfect camouflage. These features run off its own energy supply and it recharges over time when these enhancements are not in use. While the suit itself does have its own regenerating properties, it can rebuild damaged tissue quicker when the host uses armor mode. Now the suit's abilities can be disrupted by the use of EMP weapons like the K-Volt submachine gun and nano disruptor grenades. The visor itself has many functions that can be used in combat situations. Along with having a hands-free voice communicator and being able to tap into different frequencies, it also has binoculars, a processor for hacking equipment, a rebreather for underwater activity which recharges in a breathable atmosphere. Another feature is that it has thermal vision which can spot targets easily. It also has a GPS device installed on it to help the user locate specific objectives. The suit will also adapt to different gravity levels by the use of hydro thrusters. This feature is meant to be used on different planets because it does not work in space. There are several magnetic holsters for weapon and ammunition storage. The suit can also monitor the vital signs of the host and if the environment gets too cold, it has a special defrosting function. This is meant to maintain the normal body temperature of the host. It will also withstand high levels of heat and radiation. The Ceph would also use energy-based weapons. This energy could supercharge a nanosuit to almost indestructible levels. During this state, the nanosuit can take more punishment from small firearms and explosives. The Ceph energy can also recharge a disabled nanosuit. After the events on Lingshang Island, the nanosuit 2.0 is developed. The upgraded version is lighter, has more energy storage, and can also interact with Ceph technology. A transceiver device can be used to overload some Ceph units or to disable their shields. This new suit was taken by Prophet after he had a fallout with Hargreave. 
it would get another upgrade called the Final Fixing Protocol. This would boost the Nanites to their highest adaptive level. It was later revealed that the Ceph technology carries a viral spore that will infect other life forms until they cannot function anymore. The suit would act as some type of symbiote, and over time, it would bond with the host and be harder to remove. During this process, it starts to act as a second layer of skin. The suit would merge with the host and store the memories in its deep layers. When the suit fully bonds with the host, they are no longer human. They become a post-human warrior. The Nanosuit 2.0 would receive a final upgrade called the Tunguska Iteration. This was an injection that was meant to counter the virus the Ceph unleashed on Manhattan City. Jacob Hargreaves' plan was to take Prophet's suit and fight against the Ceph. This was revealed in Crisis 2 when you locate his body within a stasis pod. Although his body cannot function, his mind was relayed through some technology and displayed on a monitor in a younger version of himself. Some precautions were taken to avoid the symbiosis process. A special bodysuit was worn to prevent the suit from bonding with the host permanently. This would allow easy removal after the completion of a mission. When the suit is fully bonded with a host, it is impossible to remove safely. It would require laser surgery, and this might result in the host dying. The suit also has a built-in device that will disintegrate the armor and the host. This was to prevent it from falling into the wrong hands. The remote for this device was carried by the commander during that mission. There were various models designed by Krynet over the different storylines, but the models used by the Koreans in the first game was never reverse engineered from Ceph technology. It did have similar functions of the Krynet nano suit, but it was inferior in many ways. So if you're wondering where the nano suit comes from, just look at the Ceph. It comes from them. What are the Scar creatures in the Unreal franchise? While their name is spelled Scarge, the proper pronunciation is just Scar. Their physical appearance is a lizard-like bipedal creature. They have overhanging foreheads, glowing eyes, short curved tusks, and scaly braided dreadlocks. As they get older and mature, their tail gets longer. The manual of Unreal says they are 8 feet tall and weigh close to 375 pounds. They are extremely aggressive and also possess superior agility. In combat, their attack methods are ruthless and cunning. They are mostly seen to use their twin blades at close range, but they are intelligent enough to use numerous weapons. Their twin blades are called Razik, which can be strapped on or surgically attached to their wrists. This weapon can fire energy shots from between the blades. The Scar species is known to travel across the galaxy within their mothership and also through the use of skimmers. Their technology is superior to that of humanity. Many of the weapons in Unreal are created by the Scar. This includes the 8-Ball, Razor Jack, Ripper, Flat Cannon, and to some extent, the Stinger. The Scar species is described as sophisticated savages. This race formed an empire with the goal of ruling the universe. With their advanced technology and brute force, they were almost unstoppable. They would conquer many planets and enslave their inhabitants. When the Scar invaded Napali, they took control of everything, and the primitive aliens known as the Nali then became slaves. They were forced to mine for something called Teridium, which the Scar would use to enhance their weapons. The Nali were a peaceful and religious race who avoided war and conflict. When the race became slaves, they believe the Scar were demons sent down by angry gods for something they have done. They believe that one day a chosen one would defeat these demons and bring peace across their world. And this is when the story of Unreal starts. You play as prisoner 849 aboard the prison transport called the Vortex Rikers. When it passes Napali, the ship gets caught by the planet's gravitational pull and it crashes. As you emerge, you find yourself alive, but on a strange, unknown planet. Since the SCAR society is based off a hierarchy system, there are different types of SCAR. Some of them will even wear armor and wield specific weapons for their roles. The troopers are the younger cast of the SCAR, but are still used in combat. There have been sightings of the infantry that uses the Stinger minigun. The gunner will use the rocket launcher or sometimes the grenade launcher, able to launch a volley of explosive damage in a wide radius, which makes them very dangerous. The sniper class looks the same as the gunner, but will mostly carry the sniper rifle and sometimes use the GES bio rifle. 
the SCAR trooper will use the dispersion pistols, a very weak weapon, unless you use the secondary fire, but it does regenerate its own ammo by the use of a bright lithium power core, and the officer will be seen using the razorback weapon most of the time. It launches spinning blades that bounce off surfaces. When it comes to the other types of SCAR, we have the Scout, the Warrior, the Assassin, the Ice Scar, the Scar Lord, and the Raging Berserker, each one branding twin blades and able to fire energy projectiles at long range. They would all function the same way, but differ in speed, armor, and combat tactics. And above them, there would be a Scar Warlord. He was the leader of the attack on Nepali. He wears a full body armor suit and armed with a heat seeking missile launcher and has the ability to fly. The final battle against the Warlord takes place on the Scar Mothership. The Scar race have a history of genetic experiments. They engineered the brutes to serve them during each mission, so it's also possible they could be responsible for creating the Luminescent Scar and the Giant Scar. As for how the Scar are created, there is in fact a Scar Queen. She is the only female of that race and is a very important figure in the Scar society. The Queen is over 20 feet tall and has two fully developed arms, but the legs seem to bend in a different angle, which is different from the males. One very interesting thing about the Queen is the use of her less developed legs. Although they can be used for stabbing their prey, they can also be used for scanning the environment, similar to how insects use their antennas to inspect their surroundings. Because the Queen is so tall, she apparently cannot look down so easily, so these limbs act as a second pair of eyes, in some sense. The Queen's main role is to create Scar Pupae, which is the infant version of the species. They are 6 feet long, but still have tiny tusks, along with thin limbs to move around. If she has to defend her nest, she will attack with multiple projectiles which are launched from her 8 breasts, teleporting to different locations and holding up a shield to block incoming attacks. When the Queen was killed in Unreal, this caused the Scar species to launch an attack against humans. The Scar were mentioned briefly in a story of Unreal Tournament which came out in 1999. During the time when the humans fought against the Scar, the New Earth government was formed, and the best way to finance the war was through mining. When it seemed like the humans were losing the battle, they mounted one final assault to destroy the Scar mothership. This resulted in the Scar withdrawing their forces. As the mining continued afterwards, the miners would grow tired of the working conditions and many accidents occurred which could not be dealt with. The government would then legalize consensual murder in the year 2291. This allowed people to fight to the death under organized events. The Leandri Mining Corporation would then capitalize on this event, and by the year 2341 they would host the Grand Tournament, which became the most popular event in the sport. When it comes to the Scar homeworld, it was almost never seen in the video games, but according to the Unreal Timeline and the story in Unreal Tournament, it was named Scrath. However, details about their homeworld seem to be left in mystery. But we do know that different clans and tribes exist. When the mothership was destroyed by humans, the Iron Skull Clan was blamed for their failure. This would then cause the Black Fist Clan to go against them. The New Earth Government would later capture a Scar Scout ship, and their fascination of the species would lead to some genetic testing. They would later create a SCAR hybrid by combining human DNA with SCAR DNA. This hybrid was entered into the tournament and if it was victorious, they would be mass produced to become the leading force of ground based ops. In the game Unreal 2, the SCAR appear in three different variations. The light one wears no armor, has the least amount of health but is very quick. The medium SCAR wears little armor, so it suffers from decreased speed at the cost of more defense and the heavy scar wears the most amount of armor, but their agility is highly affected. They move very slow, but can take a lot of punishment. The story of Unreal 2 Awakening also included a robot enemy called the Drak. They were experimenting on different races, but when you enter their hive, you come across another scar hybrid. There was a massive scar named Zalor that appeared in Unreal Championship 2. It says he was captured by the Torger tribe and forced to fight in the tournament for his freedom. The leader of the Torga tribe was trying to win the tournament to become the consort to the queen, but his other goal was to unify the Scar and their slave races to rule as the dominant species in the galaxy. 
The Razik blades served as inspiration for the Unreal logo, the SCAR symbol, and also the damage amplifier in the video game. The SCAR seemed to favor the color green, which is mostly seen inside their mothership. I wanted to cover this species because they are similar to the Predator. They have advanced technology, brutal combat methods, but also have a society based on clans and a hierarchy. What is the Terror Mask in Splatterhouse, also known as the Hell Mask? It is an ancient relic of tremendous power, but it only grants this power when it has bonded with a host. The mask would attach itself to the host and transform them into a gigantic brute of destruction, fueled by revenge, hate, and anger. This massive warrior is given powers that make it almost unstoppable. The mask itself is inhabited by an immortal being from another dimension. It also displayed telekinetic powers. The host that took up the mask was Rick Taylor. It would speak to him telepathically, guiding him throughout his journey. At times, the mask would appear to aid Rick in his battles, but its true intentions remained hidden from the host. It would fool the host in many ways, through lies, manipulation, and trickery. This was just to further its own ambitions. The entity within the mask was planning to take over this dimension. The spirit within the mask could also transfer to another host, as it did with the Evil One's body in Splatterhouse 3. According to the journals of Dr. Henry West, he mentions he acquired the terror mask from an Aztec coffin. It was on the withered body of a previous host from a long time ago. When he fails to unlock the secrets within, he puts his attention to other matters. To him, it's just a ceremonial bone mask. The entity within the mask never revealed itself to Dr. West, but it does speak to Rick when he's badly injured in trying to save his girlfriend Jennifer from Dr. West. Rick puts the mask on and it transforms him into a hulking beast. It can also reach a berserk form that is even stronger. Equipped with faster regeneration, more agility, and massive bone blades from its forearms, it is believed that this form is controlled by the entity within the mask. Because once you activate this form, you see through the black and white vision of the mask. The Terror Mask was actually a slave to the Corrupted, which are described as an alien-like deity species. They come from a realm known as the Abyss, which is the home and prison of the Corrupted. It was depicted as the land of the dead. The Corrupted had enslaved the Terror Mask for an eternity. When a war broke out, it escaped through a tear in the fabric of the universe. This entity got revenge by slaying a member of the Corrupted when it was summoned during a ritual of the Five Eclipses. After this event, the Corrupted denied any entity escaping their control. Either they lied, or they believed nobody would oppose them. Since the Terra Mask spent so much time in the Abyss and learning about the Corrupted, it describes them in this way. They are everything and nothing, the many angled ones, unknowable, timeless, eternal. They inhabit the abyss, the gulf between what's said and what's understood, the place from whence stems all human suffering. Mankind can only trace their jagged silhouette around the shadow they cast across the world. They are famine, conflict, genocide. They are now and forever amen. And they're coming your way. While the Splatterhouse game in 2010 had many Easter eggs related to other franchises, one of my favorites is that the Splatterhouse 2 box art in North America and Europe had a monster that looked very similar to an adult xenomorph. At some point, the design of the mask was altered because it looked too similar to the mask of Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th. Who is Mr. Karate in the SNK universe? The story of this character starts off with Takuma Sakazaki. When he was younger, he became a rival towards Ryu Haku Todo and Lee Gakusuo. And it was the battle between Lee Gakusuo that showed Takuma's potential in martial arts. This battle would not end in a victor, but instead a draw. To honor the strength of one another, they were each given a special title. Gakusuo was named the Ultimate Tiger, and Takuma was known as the Invincible Dragon. The scar on his chest most likely came from an early battle. He did know Jeff Bogard, but also had a mysterious connection to Saisui Kusanagi and Gang Il. Throughout his training and battles against various opponents, 
Takuma would invent the Kyokugen Ryu style of karate. As time passed by, Takuma would meet a woman named Ranette, and together they would have two children, Ryo and Yuri. The family then moved to America to open a martial arts dojo, where Takuma could teach his style of karate. Ryo would study under his father's teachings alongside a student named Robert Garcia. Since Yuri was too young at the time, she was not allowed to train with them. Ronette was later involved in a car accident and passed away. Takuma would then fight his way through Southtown to confront the man responsible, Geese Howard. He demanded that Geese stop the crime in the city, but was met with threats against his children, Ryo and Yuri. To protect his family, Takuma would join Geese and work for him. But to protect the honor of his family name, he donned a Tengu mask and took up a different persona. He became Mr. Karate. He worked for Geese Howard as an undefeated hitman. This part of the story is a little different in the Super Nintendo version of Art of Fighting 2. Takuma says he was in debt from gambling and started working for Geese to raise money for his family. This version of the game also mentions that Geese was going to use Takuma to take out Jeff Bogard. And later on, they would get rid of Mr. Karate to cover their tracks. But of course, this never happened. When Geese was out of town on a business trip, he left Mr. Big in charge. This is when Takuma would end up leaving the gang, and so Mr. Big would kidnap Yuri to control Mr. Karate's actions. This would cause Ryo and Robert to fight through Southtown to find her. Mr. Big would send Mr. Karate to deal with them. However, Ryo proved to be much stronger than expected and defeated Mr. Karate. Right before Ryo was going to kill him, Yuri stepped in and stopped him to tell him that Mr. Karate is their father. Takuma Sakazaki. During the ending of Art of Fighting 2, Takuma's injuries take its toll on his body. He's getting too old and decides to hand over the responsibilities of the dojo to his children. While he does imply that he might have to retire from fighting, he was seen in the King of Fighters tournament. He would be seen without his Mr. Karate persona, and this was an attempt of redeeming himself. He enters the tournament trying to win the prize money, but at the end of King of Fighters 2003, Takuma is attacked by someone he knows. Although he is badly injured, he survives, but he was not able to say who attacked him. Some sources say he was hospitalized later on in the story due to health issues. During the King of Fighters series, he displayed the ability to throw his own key across the stage towards an opponent. The attack is very unique because it's invisible. He is the only fighter that has mastered the strongest techniques of Kyokugen Ryu Karate. This goes back to the early teachings of how it encourages the user to use their key to extend from their attacks. With enough precision and concentration, the key will flow through their attack and create a powerful force upon impact. Kyokugen Ryu Karate is described as a deadly martial art that can only be taught with a mind that focuses on self-defense. One has to master their own key before it can be used in various forms of combat. Mr. Karate later makes a return in SNK vs. Capcom Chaos. While Takuma's personality is very strict on training, his family ties are traditional. He hopes his son Ryo will marry King someday and give him a grandson. He also is very protective of his daughter Yuri. Although he returns as Mr. Karate, a more powerful version of him is seen as the final boss. This is where he is more serious during combat. Takuma's personality changes when he's Mr. Karate. He would taunt his opponents before each battle, mocking them for how weak they are compared to him. The boss version of Mr. Karate does have an ending in SVC Chaos and it shows that he is still overtraining his body despite his age. The only thing Takuma fears in life is aging. Knowing his time will come to an end soon, he still pushes on to become stronger. In later games, Ryo Sakazaki would be known as Mr. Karate. He wore the black outfit and sometimes even had a different Tengu mask over his face. Because Mr. Karate was never the real name of a person, it's more of a title or alter ego. Ryo ends up using this name when he's older and has become stronger. So that's the story of Mr. Karate and Takuma Sakazaki. I wanted to cover him because he's one of my favorite fighting game characters. He did appear in a few video games, but sometimes just making a cameo appearance or having a little role in the story like an ending. What is the tank in Left for Dead? Once a man, but now a beast. This mutation was caused from exposure to the green flu virus spreading across the country. It has mutated into a beast of strength and rage. 
The virus was known to infect humans and turn them into zombies. But in some rare occasions, this virus would alter the host and change them in special ways. And one of those rare types is the tank. It has overdeveloped arms due to its extreme muscle mutation, and in return, it has tremendous amounts of strength. Despite it being very large and bulky, it can still run fast enough to catch up to survivors. When it runs around, the earth trembles, as it can be seen using its two large arms in conjunction with its body, similar to running like a gorilla. It seems the abnormal growth in its body mostly affected its upper torso and arms, while its legs were left barely affected by the virus. The tank's body has numerous scars from previous fights and a large sore on its left chest. Its jaw seems to have merged with its chest due to mutation, and although shooting the head is the best choice at killing the infected, it seems the tank's bones have become stronger from the virus, as shooting its head does not seem to take it down that much faster. But one weakness that has proven to be effective is lighting the tank on fire. It would burn over time unless it happens to walk into water to remove the flames. But as the tank burns, it will become enraged and run faster towards the survivors. Although, a player-controlled tank would run slower when it is on fire, which is different than the tanks you encounter in the campaign. Now its method of attacking are by using its massive arms to swipe at a target. The impact from his arm would send his victims flying away and falling down. This would aid the tank if the target is in the corner, but out in the open area, this would push them further away from the tank. Now its massive arms can also hit a vehicle or object so hard that it can be sent through the air as a projectile. The tank also has the option to use its superhuman strength to rip out the rock or concrete in the ground and throw it as a projectile. They can use their brute strength to break through walls with their fists or the projectiles they throw. Now it seems the tank has suffered from some type of brain damage or cerebral infection, resulting in the tank always being in a state of rage and anger. As they charge at the humans, they let out a loud growl, which only seems to intensify when they get closer. Another useful tactic against the tank is the use of the bile bomb. It is a vial of the boomer's puke. Using this on the tank would only slow it down, as it would attract the attention of the zombies to attack the tank. Although the damage is minimal, it's purely a means of distraction. Now the skin of the tank was changed a little bit between the two games, and in the sacrifice campaign, it was seen to wear shorts and had a military tattoo. So if you've played the Left 4 Dead video games, which special infected is your favorite? The video game Left 4 Dead has many special infected variations each one having different mutations that give them special abilities. The infection has caused the smoker to make high-pitched rasping and coughing noises, which can lead to alerting the survivors if they are nearby. The clothing it wears are similar to the common infected zombies, but it does appear to be taller. Because of the mutation, its skin has become covered in growths and tumors, and when they are shot, they spurt out green smoke and blood. And like other special infected, it is not affected by the blinking red light of pipe bombs or car alarms. The mutation to its body has given it the special ability to have a very long tongue. Its tongue launches from its mouth at a very fast speed. It will automatically wrap around a target and pull them towards the smoker. Once they are close enough to the smoker, it slashes at them. If the survivor bumps into obstacles while being pulled, they will simply be stuck in place while taking damage. The normal zombies can also assist in damaging the survivor while it's constricted by the tongue of the smoker. While the smoker's tongue has great range, a survivor can still take down the smoker before the tongue completely entangles them, but these shots must be quick and accurate. When it is defeated, it will leave behind a cloud of smoke, which could be linked to its given name, the smoker. The green gas cloud will obstruct the vision of the survivors and cause them to cough if they go within the smoke cloud. There was a theory that its tongue could actually be its intestines. This could be possible because of how long it is upon death. Another theory is that its tongue is an extra appendage because upon death, you can see the smoker's original mutated tongue inside its mouth. During its transition to the second game, its appearance was altered in a few ways. Its left arm was given more tumor-like appendages and extra tongues were added to the body on various parts. It also is seen to walk with a limp and walk slower than the other special infected. 
A survivor can be freed from the smoker's grasp by pushing the smoker, shooting his tongue, or directly putting the smoker down with any weapon. If only the tongue is destroyed, it will take around 30 seconds to recharge its main ability. The Hunter in Left for Dead is an agile special infected that was mutated by the infection. Its appearance is always seen wearing sweatpants and a hooded sweater. When you look closely at its eyes, it seems the surrounding skin was clawed off or mortified from the infection. It's hard to tell if this was self-inflicted or if the infection caused this layer of skin to change this way. The hunter would give off a distinct growl and snarl when they spot a survivor. It also makes loud screams as it catapults itself over great distances. The mutation would increase the hunter's strength and agility. This can be seen when it crawls then leaps into the air towards a target. It can choose to jump across short distances to become a fast target or to confuse them by jumping extremely high. While the hunter jumps all over the place while screaming, it can act as a distraction while the other special infected move in for an attack. The hunter can do more damage if they leap from higher altitudes, but this requires great timing and angles. In some rare occasions, the hunter can roll off a survivor. This would give him a split second to attack again because it was not stunned by a push. Upon landing on a target, it will hold them down and slash at their flesh repeatedly, mauling and tearing them apart until the survivor runs out of health or if the hunter is pushed off or shot down. Although its main ability demands that the hunter crawl on all fours, it can sometimes be confused for regular zombie because it can also run on its two legs and look similar amongst the common infected. The single player version of the hunter also has a special jump that can be used without crouching. It is a separate ability from the pounce which causes the target to be pushed away. It's not available in versus mode, but it can be accessed through console commands. The infection seems to have affected the male population in creating hunters, because no traces of female hunters have been seen. Even though its eyes have been damaged, it's possible the other senses of the hunter were heightened from exposure to the infection. There was a theory that its screeching and growling noises could be a form of echolocation. Its sense of smell might also help it distinguish between survivor and infected. The hunter also appears to not be affected by the sound of pipe bombs or car alarms. The jockey is another special infected variation that appeared in Left 4 Dead 2. The green flu virus, which is known as the infection, has affected the jockey to develop large amounts of muscle mass on its upper back and neck. This mutation would give the jockey increased strength to take control of a survivor when it hops on their back. The jockey's hopping ability is short range, but can travel further if you aim higher, similar to what you can do with the hunter's pounce ability. Now the jockey does not have to crouch to use its hopping ability. The infection has also affected other parts of the jockey's body. Its fingers and toes have increased in length. If we look at the lips around its mouth area, the skin here has deteriorated away, which exposes the teeth to give a more skeletal look. Since the infection can have psychological effects on the host, it could have caused mania in the jockey, which could have led to him chewing or clawing away at its lips. This mental illness can also be noticed when the jockey rides a survivor. It laughs hysterically and with great excitement. The jockey is hunched over while its arms are laid out in a praying mantis formation while having a slight coat of blood on them. The hands of the jockey will also twitch and shake even when it stands still. The jockey's pounce ability allows them to control the survivor to some extent. It does not take full control of their movements, but rather shifts between the jockey's movements and the survivor trying to regain control of their character. It's a battle of taking control of the survivor while both players' inputs are being read back and forth, but the majority of the time will be the jockey having more time to control the survivor's movements. This can be used in conjunction with the spitter's acid, the boomer's puke, and even pulling the survivors towards a witch. The jockey can be as good as the charger, smoker, and hunter. When all four of you attack at the same time, the confusion can lead to the survivor spreading out and you can jump on one of them and steer them away. The jockey can also use its control over the survivor to steer them into holes or ledges, although this can result in the jockey sacrificing itself, but also it's a great use of its ability. While the jockey is taking control of a survivor, 
his hold on them can be disrupted by other things, like explosions from canisters or boomers, the hunter pounce, the smoker's tongue, and also the charger's special attack. And like most of the special infected, the jockey can be pushed by the survivors. Even a push during its pounce attack can result in an instant death. Now the pounce can recharge almost instantly when it misses a target, but can take longer when you down a survivor in different ways. And as a last resort, its standard melee attack is not that strong in close range. And as with all special infected, it's better to utilize the special ability to assist your team. The special infected in the Left 4 Dead franchise are all very unique, each one possessing special abilities that reflects their names. While the virus has swept across the country, transforming humans into zombies, in some rare occasions, the mutation reaches another stage. This time, we're going to have a look at the Charger. The Charger was designed to quickly separate the survivors with one attack that would drag one person far away from the others. If the Charger runs into more than one survivor, the others will get knocked back. His running speed seems to be the same as the other survivors, but he excels in a burst of speed as he sprints to charge forward with his special attack. While he runs, he will not stop until he reaches a certain distance or smashes into an object or wall. While the charger's height is similar to the tank, its body type is not as wide. While the tank has very small legs that can barely support its massive size, the charger's legs have developed enough muscle mass to hold its own body weight. Its skin color has mutated to appear more green. Although it's grown in size, it still wears the clothing it once had before the mutation. It wears a denim-like pair of jeans with overalls, and although it's missing one shoe, it still wears the other one on its right foot. The mutation has caused its right arm to overdevelop, while the left arm has shriveled up and has become useless. Its right arm is so large and heavy that the charger now slumps over to the right side as it moves. The muscles have overdeveloped so much that its fingers have now become stubby. His left leg seems to have been affected by the mutation more than the right leg. The charger sprints with its left leg, so perhaps that's why it's grown in size. Because of the charger's method of attack, it seems his right arm has sustained a lot of damage. You can see battle scars all over its huge arm. The right side of its face seems to have suffered constant damage from charging. The cranium has been dented, he lacks any teeth, and the nose has been removed. While the charger does make some noises when moving around, it also lets out a loud noise once it starts charging. As it charges forward, it keeps the right arm in the front to smash into anything. If it makes contact with the survivor during the charge, he will grab them and run a good length until it stops or smashes into an object or wall. From here, the charger would hold onto the survivor and smash them into the ground or into the surrounding area. And just like the other special infected, the charger does not release a survivor until either he or the survivor is dead. Players using the charger should make use of a large hole, charging towards a survivor and bring them over the edge for an instant death. The sacrifice you make here will pay off as you will be able to respawn to assist your team, while the survivors cannot respawn. Since the charger is so large, it's best to use them with ambush techniques, hiding in the bushes or charging through doors or narrow hallways. Charging from too close of a range might not affect the other survivors that much, as it will just cause them to stumble. Therefore, it's better to charge the group for a longer range to build up momentum. This will cause you to knock down the other survivors you run through, but keep in mind that once you start charging, you cannot change the direction, so your aim has to have good timing. During the development of the Charger in Left 4 Dead 2, it was supposed to be a large zombie with an armored skull and tiny T-Rex arms, or it was going to appear as a dog with a tripod design. The final version did eventually take some of these ideas. It does only have three functional limbs, their two legs and one arm, while the left arm is floppy and does not function at all. They also used a reskinned Hunter model just to test out the ideas of the Charger. This also gave them time to come up with the sounds for him. Its temporary warning call was, I, I, I. This was stated in the developer's commentary. Its attacks were also undergoing different changes. His melee attack used to be an overhead strike to smash the survivors into the floor before pounding on them. 
its right arm would be used in a lunging formation. His skin was also supposed to appear more bloody, while the face exposed part of its skull. This of course was changed in the final version. A body of the charger can be seen in the first chapter of the Swamp Fever campaign. It is hung in the shape of the Greek character Lambda. It's a similar shape to the logo used for the Half-Life video games. What is the darkness? Where does it come from? It was listed as an ancient and ruthless force of chaos and destruction, jumping from one host to another, thriving on living beings so it can spread chaos. It chooses to bond with one male host at a time. Then, when that body expires, it jumps to the next generation of the same bloodline. The darkness has bonded to many hosts during its time, but it's mostly linked to the Estacado family. The current and most powerful vessel of the darkness is Jackie Estacado, who has used the darkness powers in ways that no other vessel ever has. The darkness has been around for an extremely long time, before the beginning of the universe, the earth was formless, void, and darkness spread over the surface of existence. This was a time of ageless chaos, but God then chose to create light, and with that he made the Angelus, and the universe was created. While the darkness was the embodiment of evil, disorder, and chaos, the Angelus stood for peace, purity, and order. This would result in the two of them waging a war against each other. As they fought in their eternal war, they soon realized each one was equal in power, and neither one of them would defeat the other. So they formed a truce and consummated to create the Witchblade. It was to be the balance between the Darkness and the Angelus. The Witchblade was one of 13 mystical artifacts of supernatural origins. It looks like a jewel-encrusted right-handed gauntlet. Because it holds great power, it can only be used by a worthy user. Those who are not worthy and try to use it will have their arms removed. The Witchblade would bond with a host on a symbiotic level and grant them newfound powers. They will have access to increased strength, armor, healing, reanimate the dead, and it can shoot energy blasts. Despite this truce between the Darkness and the Angelus, the Darkness would still search for a proper vessel to serve its purpose, and then it found mankind. God's most favored creation. The darkness would find a fertile bloodline and then enter their genes. They are to be his way of manifesting his fury on earth. This primordial being would make its way through history that spanned over 10,000 years. And each time it required a new body, the host would have intercourse with a human woman, passing on the darkness to the next generation, but laying dormant until that host reached its 21st birthday. The darkness despised God and all it stood for. It would later be an enemy of heaven, and so the Vatican would later send the Magdalena to assassinate the darkness. But they were either killed or defeated in the process. While the Vatican was seen by the outside world as a holy group, they had deep ambitions of dominating the world. They were aware of arcane knowledge and the existence of the supernatural. But they kept this information to themselves. The darkness powers include healing, armor, superhuman strength, the ability to fly and control demon heads. The host can also tap into a dimension to summon darklings that will do its bidding. It can also use teleportation, reanimate the dead as zombies, absorb souls, and create black holes. The personality of the darkness seems to be some kind of sociopathic creature. It feeds off Jackie's negative emotions and is very violent in nature. Since the darkness relies on remaining in the dark to gather its powers, any form of strong light will diminish its powers. Even though the host of the darkness is immortal, it can still be killed by the sun dagger. One last weakness of the darkness is if the host impregnates a woman, the spirit of the darkness will be passed into the newly conceived child. This would result in the previous host dying at the moment the new child is born. So if you're a fan of the darkness franchise, which side are you on? The darkness or the Angelus? Let me know your answer in the comment section. What is the black light virus in prototype? Why is it so dangerous and why was it created? Before we get to that, we have to look at where it came from. The origins of this pathogen stem from the original virus called the red light virus. The red light virus was created by Blackwatch and its purpose was for being used as a bioweapon. 
This was in combination to their other directive to protect America from biological weapons. Blackwatch is not a company, but more of a special forces unit that responds to viral outbreaks. They were established in 1962 and have full authority over American military forces and the local police. The first variant of the viral strand was the red light virus, codenamed DX-1118A. This took place in the artificial town called Hope, located in Idaho. There were two viral programs conducted here. Carnival One was a Black Watch project. They would give the red light virus to chimpanzees. This was a way of seeing if it was suitable for human trials later on, and to their surprise, the chimps would gain heightened intelligence, increased strength, and a few other symptoms. Carnival 2 was the project name for human trials. At first, nothing happened, but the children born from these families were different. They also carried something else. The virus infected them in the mother's womb. The virus was trying to achieve something within their bodies, but it kept failing. They would not live longer than three years. Then, in the year 1969, the perfect host was found, Elizabeth Green. Because of her genetic makeup, she was able to adapt to the virus, and over time, her body would produce a new strain of the virus, along with being given superhuman abilities. She also gave birth to a child who was codenamed Pariah. While Elizabeth's body was creating different strains of the virus, Pariah was the result of the virus bonding with the perfect body. Not through any artificial means, it was simply born with the virus. The whole purpose of the town, Hope, was possibly to create the ultimate life form, even though the town was a mask for secret experiments. Elizabeth and her child were then taken from the town right before it was destroyed. This was part of Project Altruistic. It was covered up by saying the local groups formed a riot against the military. Elizabeth would then be transferred to different facilities over the years, until finally ending up at the Gentech building in Manhattan. The virus affected her body to stop her aging process, but as she produced new virus strains daily, her brain shut down. She was kept for future experimentation and gene manipulation. This would later result in the creation of new infected beings, like hunters, walkers, and hydras, all of them behaving in different ways, but they all shared the same hostility towards other beings. Alex Mercer was a research scientist working for Gentech. Then, after 10 years, he was able to synthesize a new viral strain called the Black Light Virus, also known as the Mercer Virus, or DX-1118C. Throughout his time at Gentech, Alex would also be curious as to the origins of the original virus, and so he started digging into the files. But Gentech was aware of his suspicions, and so they sent a team to eliminate him. He was now a liability. When they located him, Alex was cornered against a wall, and so he released the virus upon Manhattan, but in doing so, it also infected his body. He started to change. The virus was a contagious agent that caused evolutionary chimeric mutations. It acted as a retrovirus, able to insert its own genetic code into the cells of the host. The next process would include replicating other segments of the organism's DNA. Because these changes are too drastic, most subjects would not survive due to massive organ failure and cell saturation. Alex Mercer's body did survive the infection. He was then given superhuman abilities in the process, able to shapeshift his appearance to male or female, transform parts of his body into bladed or hardened weapons. His durability, physical strength, reflexes and speed were also increased. Any damaged tissue could regenerate very quickly. Black light beings could consume the bodies of other life forms. They would also gain access to their memories. A lot of times, Alex was haunted by the screaming visions of the people he consumed. Black light life forms can also gain some abilities when they consume other life forms. They would also inherit the antibodies of other creatures that are immune to parasites. This happened when Alex was injected by a parasite that was meant to destroy his body, but he found a cure within another hunter creature, thanks to Dr. Ragland. Alex Mercer was seen to have an enhanced form of vision, similar to thermal heat signatures. Other black light creatures could have developed another form of special vision. The game was titled Prototype, as it was a reference to Alex Mercer. He was the first of a model or species when it comes to the black light creatures.
Gentech would make an attempt at stopping Alex Mercer by creating a new strain of the Blacklight virus. The DX-1120 strain would create Super Soldiers, also known as Decode Soldiers. Along with a standard weapon and an infection detection device, they gain incredible strength, endurance, and a rapid healing ability. During the story of the first game, Alex does run into Elizabeth Green. When searching for more answers about the virus and its origins, she manages to escape her holding cell and releases hunters upon the city. But by the end of the story, she gets injected by a parasite from Alex, but her body rejects it and forms the Super or Supreme Hunter. Elizabeth ends up getting consumed by Alex, and he later defeats the Super Hunter or Supreme Hunter. The story of Prototype 2 introduces us to James Heller. His squad of marines are sent in to the red zone of New York City. James was enraged when he learned that Alex Mercer was the reason his wife had passed away. The infection, the creatures in the city, the viral outbreak, it was all because of Alex. While the virus outbreak is affecting the entire city, James comes into contact with Alex Mercer. Being a highly skilled marine, he beats Mercer, only for the virus to regenerate any wounds Mercer suffered. Heller later gets infected by Mercer by the Blacklight virus. This was a way of Mercer recruiting someone else to help him to fight against Gentech. But James was not the only one. There were others. Mercer was working on a plan to create more evolved creatures like him. Alex ends up capturing the daughter of James, believing she'll become the mother of the new world. This is because her DNA is resilient to the virus. The story in Prototype 2 also mentioned something about white light. It was intended to be a cure, but when Alex Mercer's blood tainted it, it would turn any black light creature into an evolved form, just like him. Alex Mercer wanted to create a world with one being, one mind. If all the tainted white light was released, it would spread the infection of evolved creatures. This would then speed the process of Alex Mercer's plans. By the end of the story, James and Alex engage in a final battle. With James coming out victorious, all he wanted was to find his daughter, and Alex had the information. After he consumed Alex's body, he became more powerful and used his tendrils to absorb other creatures across the city. This would end the outbreak of the Blacklight virus in the city. He ends up finding his daughter and they are reunited. At first, she is scared of his mutation, but later accepts him. What is Spawn? And what is his story? This character was created by Todd McFarlane. His human name was Albert Francis Simmons, but is mostly known as Al Simmons. He was not the only child in the family, as he also had two other brothers, and with him being the second. Later in his life, Al would join the United States Marine Corps and go on to achieve the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. After some time, he would join the United States Secret Service and then his final position would reside in the CIA. He was then given a job by the director, Jason Wynn, and enlisted into the U.S. Security Group, which dealt around covert ops missions. This was an elite task force that had jurisdiction reaching from domestic to foreign situations. While Simmons would spend a good amount of time in the CIA, he reached a point where he thought to retire. Director Jason Wynn would put Simmons on one last job, but little did he know Jason Wynn planned to have Simmons eliminated because he thought Simmons was a spy. Under the orders of Jason Wynn, Bruce Stinson, also known as Chappelle, would take out Simmons. And after his death, Al Simmons would go to hell because of the life he spent as an assassin. And there, he would meet Malbolgia, one of the many leaders of hell. Simmons would form an agreement with Malbolgia to become a hell spawn, and in return, he would be allowed to see his wife one more time. Malbolgia's plan was to create an army of Hellspawn to start the apocalypse on Earth. They were to be his army in the coming war to bring down the gates of heaven and make Earth a living hell. When Spawn returns to Earth, his memory has faded away, his body is now disfigured, but he also possessed incredible and limited magical powers. He was also watched over by a demon clown called the Violator. He would act as Spawn's mentor on Earth, but at the same time, he would despise any human of becoming a Hellspawn. He sees them as unworthy and has often voiced his opinion in this matter. When Al returns to see Wanda one more time, five years have passed since his death. And to make matters worse, Wanda married Al's best friend, Terry, and they had a daughter together. After this event, Spawn would be conflicted with his emotions and decisions. He would reside on Earth, but use his powers to take down street gangs and other evil people. While on Earth, he would meet Cogliostro, who revealed 
that he was also a hellspawn, but he revolted against Balboja a long time ago and tells Spawn that his powers have a limited resource, and when it is all used up, he will be condemned to eternal torment in hell. Cogli Ostra would act as a good mentor to Spawn. He does not want Al Simmons to fall into darkness and teaches him to use his powers for good, not evil. Spawn would later choose to not be part of Malboja's plan to overthrow Earth. He then becomes the anti-hero while fighting the forces of Hell and also battles the forces of Heaven. And that's the origin of Spawn. Now I gotta say, the comic book art style done for Spawn is one of my favorite. It's incredibly detailed and the colors are vibrant. You can tell they spend a lot of time drawing this character on every single page. There have been a few video games about Spawn, but the one I liked the most was on Dreamcast. It was called Spawn in the Demon's Hand. So if you're a fan of the Spawn franchise, what is your favorite character? Put it down in the comment section. What are the Nightcrawlers in Fear, Perseus' mandate? How do they fit into the story? And what is their objective? The Nightcrawlers are the main enemies in Perseus' mandate. They do battle with almost any other opponent, which includes Delta Force, Replica Soldiers, the Fear Team, and even ATC Guards. Later in the game, they are seen to also have a small encounter with Alma's apparition, but of course, they stand no chance against her. Unlike the Replica Soldiers in previous Fear games, the Nightcrawlers only have about four classes within their ranks. We have the Light Soldiers, the Heavy, the Elite, and the last one is the Commander, while the Nightcrawlers use communication between their groups, they also have similar tactical movements to the Replica Soldiers. Throughout the story, the player will encounter mostly the Nightcrawler Light Soldiers. These units all share the same voice. This could mean they might all be clones. They could also be masking their voice to hide their identity, or maybe the developer did not want to use different voice actors. The Nightcrawler Commander is the leader of the Nightcrawler group. His entire mercenary team were sent in to steal Armacam's genetic research. Their main focus was getting Alma Wade's DNA, but this is not their only goal, which is later revealed in the game. Before we continue with the Nightcrawlers, I have to point out one important and mysterious character in the Fear story, the Senator. This person seems to have access to many secret projects and military operations. He does have a voice conversation with jean viev Aristide during the intro and ending of the first game. When they lost control of Paxton Fettel and the replica soldiers, they planned to blow up the Origin facility, but this in turn ended up freeing Alma, which is seen during the ending. jean viev Aristide was the president of ATC. When the Origin situation was resolved, jean viev mentions that the first prototype was a complete success. She is referring to Point Man. The senator then responds with, but so much for discretion. So after the first fear game, the senator is not heard from until Perseus' mandate. The senator is heard on a private call during the game's introduction to Perseus' mandate. He hired Gavin Morrison to oversee the mission and report back to him. The Nightcrawlers are working for the senator. What do you want me to do, sir? What you're good at, Morrison. You may not like the consequences. Perseus is mine. Get it back. I don't care what you have to do. Aside from the intro, we get a glimpse of the Nightcrawler commander when he and Gavin Morrison interrogate a man named Bristol. This man worked for ATC. Morrison was trying to get some encryption codes from him. He claims that Bristol ran the Perseus project for Harlan Wade. Morrison says they are going to take synchronicity with or without him. But this was merely an event, so there's nothing to steal. Bristol then says to recreate the synchronicity event, you will need Alma, but she's in a place they will never find. He is then eliminated by the commander. So now we have something else to go over. What is synchronicity? Well, it was the name given to a specific event in the story of fear, but this took place when Paxton Fettel was a boy. To sum up the story very quickly, Alma Wade was one of Harlan Wade's daughters. She was born with incredible psychic powers. She was experimented on throughout her childhood by her own father, who worked for Armachem Technology Corporation. At a young age, she was impregnated with prototypes created by her own DNA, 
and this was mixed with other researchers, including her father. Their goal was to create a psychic commander that would control replica soldiers. This battalion of soldiers were all clones. Now, the first child Alma had was at the age of 15. She gave birth to Point Man, who we see in the first game. Now, he had no psychic abilities to control the replica soldiers, but he did possess incredibly fast reflexes and would excel in military training. He would later join the fear team. Alma's second child was Paxton Fettel. He did have the psychic abilities ATC was looking for. ATC was hoping that Alma's children would inherit her psychic powers, but out of the two prototypes, only Paxton Fettel was seen as the proper candidate to control the replica soldiers, so he was placed into active training around this project. And this is where the synchronicity event comes into the story. It's a term given to when Alma Wade makes a telepathic connection with Paxton Fettel. While we don't see this in Fear, it's to expansions or in Fear 2, this scene is shown in the post credits of Fear 3. It shows Paxton Fettel when he was around 10 years old. He makes contact with Alma, and she makes him aware of what Harlan Wade and ATC did to her. Paxton goes through a psychic seizure and eliminates the guards coming into his room. The connection he makes with Alma the first time is so intense that Paxton's psychic powers become uncontrollable. As the guards move in to tranquilize Paxton, they are taken down one by one. While this was seen as the first synchronicity event, there was a second time this happened. Many years later, when Paxton Fettel is an adult, he has full control of the replica soldiers through his psychic abilities. This is around the time Alma makes contact with Fettel again. She shows him the intense pain she went through as a child, when her own father conducted many experiments on her and even took away her babies. Paxton feels the raw edge of Alma's pain. She wants revenge, and Paxton is going to help her. Now that he has a full army to control, he uses them to find the location of Alma. He wants to set her free. While it's not clearly explained how Fettel is able to dissolve into ashes in the first fear game, it's possible the second synchronicity event could have given him this ability through the connection he made with Alma. Even though he is alive during the first game, it's hard to pinpoint how he has this ability, or perhaps what we see is just an image projected through his psychic powers. During Fear 3, some past conversations and memories are displayed. It mentions how Harlan Wade favored Paxton Fettel over Point Man. The psychic abilities that Paxton had at an early age is what Harlan wanted to focus on. Paxton was already showing potential in being the psychic commander for the replica army. He pushed Paxton during various testing procedures. He wanted Paxton to excel, since Point Man was a disappointment in Harlan's eyes. Now, while Point Man did go through some testing himself, he was still seen as a failed prototype when compared to Paxton Fettel. That's much better. Better than I hoped. So, going back to the Nightcrawler classes, we saw the light soldiers, which mostly carry the VES advanced rifle, which comes with a red scope. This new rifle will have better armor penetration, provides more accuracy when shooting, and it has a larger zoom due to its built-in scope. So the Nightcrawlers who use this weapon will do more damage when compared to the replica soldiers that use the standard G2A2 assault rifle. You will later make contact with a Nightcrawler heavy class. They have a different design which includes a change to their armor, helmet, and attachments. Just like the Light Soldiers, they can use the same weapons as them, but they have access to the HV Penetrator, Laser Carbine, and Repeating Cannons. And here we have the Nightcrawler Elites. They serve as squad leaders. They are seen as the veteran members within this mercenary force. What separates them from the previous two classes is they are fewer in numbers, but they make up for that with incredible combat skills, armor, and weapons. Their outfits are similar to the other classes, except they don't wear any helmets. Instead, they wear specialized goggles. You get a glimpse of a Nightcrawler Elite very early into the game in the sewers. 
It throws a knife at a door in front of you, then it quickly jumps through a hole above to escape. If you enter this area backwards, this cinematic will not happen. So it's meant to be a surprise when you walk forward, but you have to turn around fast just to see it. When you battle against your first Nightcrawler Elite, you will quickly see that they are very formidable opponents. They have increased reflexes and agility, able to move as fast as the point man and sergeant. The constant use of slow-mo is advised when fighting against Nightcrawler Elites. We can also see that the Elites are able to climb walls, jump off and launch frag grenades, or dodge and roll during combat, which makes them even more dangerous. Like other Nightcrawlers, the Elites are also shown to taunt the player with vocal messages during combat. They will use a variety of weapons like shotguns, VES advanced rifles, grenade launchers, the lightning arc weapon, MP50s, carbine lasers, and turrets. When you encounter two Elites at the same time, the battle can be extremely hard. Their enhanced reflexes and agility makes them unpredictable. Next we have the Nightcrawler Commander who is seen alongside Gavin Morrison when they interrogate Bristol for the encryption codes. When they don't get the codes, the commander eliminates Bristol. They notice the camera in the room is active, and he destroys it. The next time we see the commander, he is talking to Morrison about their mission. While he's supposed to work alongside him, Morrison threatens the commander. This seems to cause some tension between them. Then, when Morrison walks away, the commander tells his elites, after they complete their task, eliminate Morrison. A team of Nightcrawlers are then sent out towards their next mission. Sometime during the story, the player would find a recorded message from the Nightcrawlers. They mention the Senator is becoming more trouble than he's worth. This mercenary team was possibly going to consider changing their plans. Despite this minor problem, they continue with their mission. One thing that I wanted to point out was a scripted event during the mission called Base Camp. You can find it during Interval 5. It's the place with the trains inside the warehouse and some cars at the back. When you step on an area within this radius, the game will activate the scripted event. It happens really fast and all you see is a shadow from this angle. Now you can get a better angle near the cars at the back, but it involves jumping on certain parts of the train. From this area, you can get a better look at what passed by the window. If you're able to zoom in, you can see it's just a Nightcrawler Elite. But it's not using a proper jumping animation, it's just their standing pose going up in the sky, which I thought was kind of weird. So back to the story, the Nightcrawlers end up betraying Morrison and confine him to a cage. The sergeant finds him later on and they release Morrison in exchange for his assistance. He reveals the Nightcrawlers are trying to get Alma's DNA. They were supposed to hand it over to Morrison, but they betrayed him and left him behind. Morrison does lead the sergeant to a secret underground tunnel, where they run into an apparition of Paxton Fettel. Morrison and the sergeant will see a hallucination of Alma, but shortly after, Morrison is eliminated when an armored truck is launched into the air and crushes him. She had been dead for three years when she first came for me. She destroyed them with the raw edge of her pain. Give it back! Tell me you saw that. The Nightcrawler Commander is seen near the end of the game extracting Alma's DNA. He quickly runs off and the Sergeant gives chase. The Commander does escape, but the two of them would meet up later on. The Commander is then shown briefly fighting against replica forces during his escape. Now, during your battle against the Commander, he would show similar abilities as the Elites. For example, having increased reflexes to dodge, bouncing off walls to throw two grenades, and using a variety of heavy weapons. The only difference is this battle is fought during two sequences. The commander will use available cover in the battlefield and jump up to higher ledges to gain an advantage point. Even though the commander has a different skin and rank, he pretty much functions the same as an elite. 
The second encounter has him using an MP50 repeating cannon. Other nightcrawlers will come to his aid, but the sergeant would eventually defeat him and retrieve Alma's DNA. But the story does not end here. The post credits ending sequence shows one nightcrawler elite meeting up with the senator. We hear the senator ask, losses, and the nightcrawler elite responds with, acceptable. This could mean the nightcrawler forces are even bigger than what we saw in the game. Despite how many of them were eliminated in the story, those losses were worth completing the mission. While the player reclaimed Alma Wade's DNA, other nightcrawler forces were sent out to retrieve Pax and Fettel's DNA. This is what the senator gets a hold of. A message from Captain Reigns during the game does imply the nightcrawlers are not just a small group of mercenaries, but in fact, a freestanding army. They had files on the entire fear team and other people. So they had connections from someone who was able to get a hold of this information. Now, it's hard to say just how far up the political ladder this goes. All we know is the senator would use the nightcrawlers for special missions. So that covers the story on the nightcrawlers in Fear Perseus Mandate. Out of all the fear games, this enemy is my favorite. So I wanted to cover their story and other elements of each member.